I greet you again in Jesus' name and welcome your attention to the Word of God this morning. Raise your hand if you can finish this statement. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words... Many of you know that. Raise your hand if you believe it. Saw one hand almost go up, then it came back down. That statement is not true. Words can hurt. Words can hurt you. Maybe not physically, you don't feel it in your bones and skin, but emotionally, words are powerful. Words are, can be very destructive and hurtful. And not only can they stir up conflict, but they can cause pain, rejection inwardly, result in broken relationships between people. They can destroy one's self-esteem and self-worth. So I appreciate what we already heard, the challenge this morning, to be a blessing to one another. And that's what this message is intended to do as we look at Ephesians 4, 29. You'll find it printed in your bulletin. You can use it there, but have it in front of you, or open your Bibles to Ephesians 4 and underline it in your Bible if you don't mind underlining. Ephesians 4 is part of the very, very practical section of the book where the Apostle Paul is is writing to born-again Christians. They've been saved by grace. They've been saved through faith in Jesus Christ. That's not of works as any man should boast. But now he calls them to a life of good works, of good faithfulness, and he calls them to live that life of faith out in a positive and good way. He repeatedly talks about this life as a walk. Walk in love. Walk in, in the spirit. Walk in, in your Christian life. He calls us repeatedly to put off the old self, that natural, inborn, sinful self, put that off and its ways and its practices and put on, like clothing, put on the new self, the Christian, the Christian identity and behavior and life. And so verse 29 is a part of this practical section calling us to put off the bad and to put on the good and it comes as a strong command, and I just start with that here this morning. This is a command. It's not a mere suggestion or even a good set of guidelines, but it's command. You might say orders from headquarters. Uh, let's read together Ephesians 4.29. We'll do this several times today, so keep a copy of it in front of you until you have it memorized. Altogether, Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. So much in the whole practical section of Ephesians is given to the words that we speak to one another. It's kind of remarkable how often that, that comes up. Paul talks about speaking the truth in love. He talks about putting away bitterness and anger and wrath and evil speaking. He says, put away falsehood, all falsehood. No foolish talk, he says. No crude jest, joking or impurity, but rather thanksgiving. And that's an expression with our mouths. And so the emphasis in this passage comes to a really sharp focus in this one verse. And I want to challenge us with this verse this morning. Even while verse 32 is much more often memorized and, and referred to, uh, and verse 31 outright names some of the grievous sins that Christians must put off, many of which are, spoke, are spoken words. Verse 29 is the emphasis that I believe this passage focuses in on. Speech is a very powerful tool. Words, even the words I'm speaking to you now, are coming from my mouth and through the airwaves and going who, who knows where. But some of it is going into your ears. And as such, because it is spoken language, it conveys a message. And the message comes into the ears, into the brain, into the heart and spirit, and 
does its thing there? What kind of a thing does it do? Is it bringing a blessing or is it hurtful and damaging? Our words are powerful. Speech is one of the most powerful things that the Lord God has given us for expressing truth, for ex conveying the gospel, for impacting other people's lives. We do it so automatically, so seamlessly, so effortlessly. We don't even think about the fact that first there's thoughts in our head and then they are sort of put into the English language and they come out as words and they're going out to impact others. But that's what is happening here. Youth, anyone under the age of 25, youth and children, let me hear you read this verse together. All ready? Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. All right, now everybody, let's say it. Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. The first word is let. It means allow or permit. That indicates that we can control what comes out of our mouths. It is up to us to let it out or not let it out. It is up to us to prevent harmful words from coming out that would escape and go out and do a damage in someone else's experience or spirit. Our natural tendency is just go ahead and spout off, sometimes even without thinking first. But the Bible reminds us that our natural response is to be put off. What's natural, what's sinful, must be put aside we're responsible to control those words. Commands like this one are not optional. It must be obeyed. We are responsible before God to control our tongues. Even in the Old Testament, keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. It's your job. It's my job. It's our responsibility. The prayer of a Christian should be daily. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep a watch over my lips. Jesus himself spoke very plainly about our words, like in Matthew 12. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's inside comes out. You've got to control it. Because Jesus said further in the same passage, by your words you will be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. So watch your words. God does. And he notes and pays attention to what we say. Just because you think something in your head doesn't mean you need to say it with your mouth. Or write it on your keyboard. Or paper. Or text it. Or post it. It's no excuse to say... Well, I was just being honest. That's how I feel. Duh. Remember, put off the old natural stuff. Put it aside. Don't express it. Your words are revealing yourself. That old self, you must put it off, not show it off. Our problem sometimes is that we're not embarrassed by our old self. We're not embarrassed by what's going on in our sinful heart. We're so used to it, we sort of think it's normal, natural, it's okay. It's, uh, well, you know, it's just the way I am. Uh-uh. Paul tells us, put off the old self, put on Christ's self, put, it, put those things away. Hurtful words that go out and damage others, hurtful words that impact others and squelch their spirit, hurtful words that cause pain and ill will are not normal.
They might be natural, but that's the old self, the natural old self, the sinful self. So with that first word, let, let's admit that we have responsibility for the words that we speak, and we have that responsibility before God to control that speech. So the first part of our verse today talks about the imperative, the imperative of controlling our words, our talk. It is a strong and it's a negative command, but so are many of the Ten Commandments. They're strong and they're negative. Thou shalt not. That's what this one is. Thou shalt not corrupting words. Don't let them out. Don't think of a thou shalt not as some kind of a restrictive and, and depriving command that's robbing you of some, something you ought to do. No, it's not that at all. It's just limiting what you should do by saying not this, but then it's leaving the whole realm of other things open for you to do and enjoy and uh, engage in. Even if there's one negative command here, there's four positives. We'll get to them. So there's one negative, no corrupting talk. And then there's four positives. Good, building up, fitting the occasion, giving grace. And all of these words, even the corrupting words, have one thing in common. The one thing they have in common is they're making an impact on somebody else. They're making an impact on someone else. Our words do that. And God is in giving directives here for our speech on the basis of what we say and how it affects other people. Speech is not about me then. It's about the person that's listening or hearing it. The person that's receiving that message. So my speech is not to be a vent for my feelings. That's rather selfish to just think about myself and getting something off my chest. So I must weigh what I say to share that I care. Let's be careful what we say or what its effect might be on others. So those forbidden words are corrupting talk. No corrupting talk come out. Somehow squelch it, stop it, put a hand over your mouth, uh, clamp your jaws shut. Corrupt means that something is rotten or unwholesome. It's polluted and evil. But the word is not corrupt. The word is corrupting. Did you notice? It's not just that these words in themselves are corrupt, but that they have a corrupting impact on others. That is, what is rotten in itself is making other things also rotten. What is unwholesome in itself is causing unwholesome thoughts and responses in other people. What is polluted is polluting others. Let nothing corrupting come out of your mouth be careful of what you say, lest it have a harmful or negative effect on others. So spoken words are a moral issue. It is a moral issue, what we say and how we talk. It can be good. It can be righteous, upbuilding, helpful. It can be positive. It can be a blessing. On the other hand, it can be very negative, And it can be sin, outright sin, what we say. Even though it is nothing tangible and is nothing visible, it is sin to have that negative, hurtful impact, degrading impact on the listener. Right away we think of, well, gossip. Certainly gossip is one of these things, and so it is. What is gossip? Gossip is idle talk about the personal affairs of another. Idle talk, da-da-da, about the personal affairs of somebody else. Usually, often, it's detrimental information, giving a bad report. What is slander? Slander is telling something about another person, may be true, but with the intention to hurt and damage that person's reputation, 
the image that they have uh, in others. It's a malicious motive. Slander is ha, perhaps is a false statement that discredits someone, puts somebody in a bad light intentionally. Both gossip and slander give the hearer a negative impression of someone else. That's why it's corrupting. It's putting a negative impression in that person's mind about so-and-so. And so it's corrupting that person's mind to what they think about so-and-so. Now, if you stop to think about it, the corrupting effect is happening in the listener because he's thinking bad thoughts, negative impressions about another person. But it's also corrupting that other person. His damage, his reputation is being damaged. His, the thoughts that people have about him are being negatively brought down and are degraded. And it's also having a negative, hurtful, corrupting influence on me, the speaker. If I'm doing the gossiping or the slander and I'm corrupting your mind about him and his reputation being corrupted, it's also corrupting my person. Didn't Jesus say... What comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. Because I, the speaker, am damaging my own self by spreading negative things about others. So it's revealing my evil character as well. Well, let's go on. Another kind of corrupting talk are lies, of course getting other people to believe something that's not true, deceiving them. Or angry and impatient words that go into the hearer and build resentment, reaction, or res resentment, defensiveness, ill will, bitterness, Anger and impatient words. But then there's criticism, demeaning words, put downs, name calling. These are corrupting also in the way they squelch a person's spirit and discourage one. Let's read our text again, all together. Ephesians 4 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Well, now, if corrupting talk is not allowed, what is allowed? Certainly you're not throwing up your hands and saying, well, then I can't say anything. Oh, yes, there's lots of things to talk about that's not corrupting. And here we have four right off the bat. Good words, words that are beneficial, helpful, doing, having a good impact on others, words that are building up, upbuilding words. That's our second one, uh, words that encourage and lift the spirit. Do you ever say something to someone and just see the, the anxiety and the tension in their face? Relax. Or you see someone and their response is a smile because of what you said that's what we're talking about, upbuilding and encouraging others with what you say. A person is giving confidence when they know they're being listened to or noticed, when they know that someone has cared for them and appreciated or affirmed them. Upbuilding words. Words that are fitting the occasion. The Amplified says, according to the need and the occasion. Something that fits that situation and is Meeting the need of the hour. Meeting the need in that person. And again, the concept is your words will impact them in a way that is suitable for their need. And finally, grace-giving words. Words that give grace. They enable one. They encourage one to be strong and to be built up. And they bolster their spirit I think of how Jesus responded to the woman taken in adultery. Shameful, embarrassing, humiliating, disgraceful situation. And somehow Jesus, 
diffused that. The accusers went away, and it was just him and her, and he says, woman, where are your accusers? No, man. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And with that, Jesus extended grace to her, and she could stand up, free of the condemnation and the guilt and the shame and the failures of her past, moving forward with a hopeful outlook to the future because life in the future, life from here on, sinning no more is a possibility and I can do that and he's encouraging me and blessing me in that. And so Jesus gave grace by his response to her in not condemning but rather sending her on her way with peace. So it's our privilege to bless one another. It's our privilege to be a blessing, to brighten the day of someone else, promoting wholesome thoughts in them, somehow encouraging their spiritual life, even as somebody with a phone call did to Calvin, encouraging them with a, a word of, of counsel and, and uh, support. Your words should be a present or a gift. Somebody said that your, your words ought to be a silver box with a bow on top that you're giving to someone and brightening their day with a little present. Make your responses that you say to others something that conveys affirmation and blessing, something that says you care about them and notice them. Just plan in advance what you what might say. They say, how are you? You might say, I'm fine, hoping you're having good, as good a day as I am. Communicating that you are interested in them and you're wanting good for them. They might say, well, what are you doing today? Well, one thing I'm doing is praying that God will bless you. And again, affirming them, noticing, not taking everything in a selfish way about you, but reflecting some interest in them. Answering the phone. Hello? Yes, thank you for taking my call. I appreciate your service. We, you're doing a good job. Even over the phone, you can communicate blessing and encouragement, or when you're writing a note, or an email, or a text, you do the same thing. Let someone know that you ex you're complimenting and encouraging them, and you're blessing them. You remember Isaiah? When he saw his vision of God, he felt so undone and so unworthy. He felt so sinful. And the, the angel took with the tongs a hot coal from the altar of God and touched his lips with it. Said, now your lips are cleansed. Now you can go forth. And with that cleansing, Isaiah said, here am I, send me. And his lips were cleansed to now share good words. Words of truth from God, words to the people from God. So when you go, go with a cleansed lip, a cleansed mouth, a mouth that is cleansed and forgiven, sanctified and set apart for God to speak his words. Where is he sending you? He might just be sending you to the kitchen to take care of the children at home. What's the impact of your words in the kitchen on your children? Maybe sending you to the job with your coworkers. How can you bless and encourage them? How can you speak a word to them that turns their attention to God, to good, to right living, to hope? Maybe sending you to school. There you interact with your fellow students and your teachers. What are your words to them? Do they make a good impact there? Maybe your work is on the computer, sending emails, sending texts, sending messages. Instead of words that berate or criticize or belittle others, find fault, choose good words. Instead of disrespect and intimidation, which destroy one's spirit, choose words that are upbuilding. 
instead of humiliation and ridicule, put down, which squelch a person's self-esteem, gracious words build them up. Because once corrupting words come out of the mouth, you can't get them back. They're out there. They're doing their damage. They're making their effect. Is it a good effect? Or is it a negative one? Our text calls us to be always careful to send words that make a good and positive effect. There's an Old Testament story that provides a vivid illustration of the power of words. The power of corrupting words and the power of gracious words. This story shows that gracious words are powerful and effective. It's in 1 Samuel 25. The story of David and Nabal and Abigail. David and his band of men were hiding in the wilderness from King Saul. In the wilderness, David's band of men were a protective force in the community. But at one point, David learned that Nabal was having a huge sheep shearing celebration with lots of food, and he sent some of his men to go and ask if they could have some too. Nabal's response was an example of corrupting talk. Who is David, son of Jesse? Lots of servants are running from their masters these days. Should I give my hard-earned bread and meat for men who come from who knows where? Nothing. When the report came to David, you can see the corrupting impact it had on his heart. Immediately he responded. He reacted. He responded with corrupting words himself. Put on your swords, let's go. All this time we've been guarding this man's territory and property and nothing has come, uh, he's not lost anything and he's going to treat us like this. We'll wipe them out before morning. Nabal's wife, Abigail, heard what had happened. She immediately responded. She set out with lots of food and on her way, she's planning, what shall I say? What shall I say? Listen to what she says. When Abigail saw David, she hurried and got down from the donkey and fell before David on her face and bowed to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, on me alone, my Lord, be the guilt. Please let your servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your servant. Let not my Lord regard this worthless fellow Nabal, for as his, yes, his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him, with him. But I, your servant, did not see the young man of my Lord whom you sent. Now then, my Lord, as the Lord God lives, and as your soul lives, because the Lord God has restrained you from blood guilt and from saving with your own hand, now then, let your enemies be as those who seek to do evil to my Lord, as Nabal. Now, let this present that your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your servant, for the Lord God will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord God, and evil shall not be found in you as long as you live. When the Lord God has done to you according to all the good he has spoken concerning you, he's appointed you prince over Israel, you shall have no cause of grief or pangs of conscience for having shed blood without cause or for my Lord working servant, salvation himself. And when God has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your servant. And with those words, David's anger and retaliatory actions were squelched and calmed. He immediately changed his tune he thanked her for coming to speak to him. What was it in Abigail that prompted such an attitude change in David's life and heart? I see four questions that she was thinking about and asking herself as she was pondering, how shall I address this man? Here she is, one woman against 400 men with swords, 
she doesn't have a chance. And she was in a dangerous situation, but her whole family was in a dangerous situation. Her whole family was about to be wiped out. I've got four questions. I'll give you each section one. You over here, remember this one. Abigail was wondering, how can I calm this volatile, explosive situation? How can I calm it down? She wasn't about to throw gas on the fire. That would only make things worse. Rather, she wanted to put the fire out. So she considered words that would impact an angry man and help him calm down. She intervened and prevented a slaughter. She intervened and prevented retaliation on her husband and the entire family. Second question she asked for you guys to remember. How can I honor him? She began with such humility. It got off the donkey, down on the ground, face all the way to the ground. She talks about herself as your servant. I'm your maidservant. She talks about David as my Lord, the Lord, the master. She continues all the way through with very careful respect. She didn't blame or accuse him. There were things that David wasn't doing right here. He was retaliating in anger. Yes, he was. She didn't go there. She rather continued with respect and she appealed carefully to him and to listen and to not regard the negative words that Nabal had spoken. The third question, you guys remember. How can I bless him? How can I you know, bless him, do something good for him? Well, she began by predicting for him the good response that he would make. She's believing the best in him, and she's getting him to think about a positive way through this and the results that would happen if he, uh, if he kept, if he, you know, responded well. She brought the Lord into the conversation. And in doing that, she brought David into thinking about God and his purpose and his will for the nation and for David and for them. She was answering the question, how can I bless him? She pictured a hopeful future for David. She saw ahead and she told him, when you get to be king, God's going to make you king. That's his promise. When you get to be king, you're going to look back and you're not going to have a guilty conscience about this day because you didn't kill anybody. You won't feel bad about needless bloodshed. And so she's In a subtle way, she's appealing to his conscience to do the right and honorable thing and to wait on God for his timing. And the fourth question, and maybe this is the hardest one of all, I'll give to you to remember. Will you forgive me? Abigail wasn't even there when Nabal blurted out his corrupting talk. But she was part of that situation. She was part of that family. She was part of the family that was about to get wiped out. Will you forgive me? She went so far as to ask David to forgive her. Not as a ploy to try to get her way, but as a sincere and humble request She admitted that what had happened was wrong. She admitted that it was foolish what Nabal had said. She identified with her family and their wrongs. She's basically saying we're all in the same boat. And then she asked David to forgive her. That's hard. That's humbling. On the other side of the coin, it's hard also to say, I forgive you.
David didn't verbalize that in the story, but I think in his heart he did. In fact, he later took Abigail, then a widow, to be his wife. So he certainly didn't hold anything against her. But to say, I forgive you, is also difficult. But those three words will powerfully affect you, the speaker. Whether you say them out loud to the person that hurt you, it's not always the best or appropriate. Maybe they're not even wanting forgiveness. But to at least say them to God, God, I forgive him. I forgive her. I release them to you. I let go the hurt that they did against me. I release their debt. And I commit them to you, God, to judge them and do what's righteous. If we justify ourselves, it only hardens our heart against the other one and against the poison of bitterness. Bitterness, that is refusal to forgive, eats away at one's soul and destroys and damages, even brings health problems. But forgiveness releases you of that. I had a very insightful remark this week as I visited David Showalter. He told me the story of a very hurtful, negative remark that someone made to him about his dear wife. I almost lost my non-resistance, David said. Now, he didn't react to that person, and he didn't even express it or confront the person, so I asked David, well, what are you doing about it? <laughs> he chuckled and he smiled and said, I'm getting over it. Just like that, I'm getting over it. And there was no bitterness, no ill will, nothing he was holding against that person for what she had said. He's getting over it, bless his heart. You know, folks, in this world, there's enough sinners around, and there's another one in my own shoes, there's going to be offenses. Offenses are going to happen. And Jesus would say, can you get over it? Are you willing to let it go? Back to Abigail. What was the first question that I asked you all to remember from Abigail? As she approached David, what was she thinking? How can I diffuse this volatile situation? How can I calm it down? Thank you. What was her second question? This group. How can I honor him? How can I show respect? And she did that all the way through, through her long speech. Third group. What else did she ask? How can I bless him? And finally, will you forgive me? You know, those are good questions for us to face also whenever we're getting ready to talk to someone. One more time, our text, Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. God commands it. Abigail modeled it. We can do it. Make it a game at home. Call your game E429. See if you can outdo each other with gracious words that edify. Let's stand for prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. 
Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace.